All right, everybody. We having fun at New York Comic Con? So I'm just going to run through these rules again. Uh, just a reminder, we don't clear rooms uh, between sessions, so if you want to stay for later panels, you can stay. If you need to use the bathroom, you can leave that exit in that corner of the room, check in with the security guard. There's a private bathroom over there so you can get easy access back in the room so you don't have to deal with lines and all that kind of stuff, right? Kind of cool. We didn't do that in the past. Yeah, thanks. Bathrooms, that's the highlight of my uh, contribution to the show. Thanks. <laughs> So also a reminder, the rest of the day after this session, we have uh, Silent Hill Revelation coming up next, Venture Brothers and Robot Chicken here the remainder of the day. So uh, with all of that stuff out of the way, I'm going to introduce our, uh, our next guest, uh, who is the executive producer of AMC's Comic Book Men. I was kind of writing a whole bio and all this and realized it probably was kind of unnecessary. I think you know who he is. Uh, please join uh, me in welcoming Kevin Smith. I guess this is it, this is the one. Right on, man, how is everybody? Now that we all know where we can shit, um, <laughs> excellent to be here. Uh, this is uh, really exciting for, for me and, and the boys because we're heading into uh, not season one, but season two of Comic Book Men this weekend, man. So. So it's awesome to be here at the New York Comic Con. It's especially awesome to be here in the fall because that means layers weather. So that means I can wear the coat again. That means I can put on an additional 10 to 15 pounds, man. So I won't be taking this off later or else you'll see I look very pregnant. But other than that, man, it's going to be a good trip. Thanks for being here. What we're going to do is uh, I don't want to blow most of the time just chit chat and stuff. I want to get to the real stars of the show, the comic book men themselves. But what we're going to do first is show you a sizzle reel of this season, a reel that Brian Nichelle, uh, our, one of our uh, creators on the show, um, is put together for everybody to watch. It's really, really good stuff. But before we do that, we'll be funny in a sec. Everybody gets out here. But before that happens, I just want to give a shout out to these four guys, man. Last year, uh, or a year and a half ago, I think it was, maybe it was one year ago, I sprang it on them, called them up, said, hey, man, we might do a show in the comic book store. And they didn't ask for it. They never wanted to be on television. It was kind of thrust upon them. And sometimes you get greatness thrusted upon you. This is not one of those occasions, but, <laughs> but I thrust something upon them anyway that wasn't dirty or sexy at all. And they rose to the challenge, which does sound dirty and sexy. But without them, we wouldn't have had a great first season. We certainly wouldn't get to season two. Um, having a little bit of success under your belt is always a shield against the shitters. And having a show on AMC was a real nice badge of honor at a time when like, people were like, this motherfucker's over. So without, <laughs> without these guys, I wouldn't have had that sort of credibility on the greatest network on the planet, the network that brings you the walking fucking dead, AMC. <laughs> So thank you to my boys, thank you to AMC, man. Let's take a peek at what season two has in store for us, and then we'll bring them up here and we'll all chit-chat for a while, shall we? Give it up! Kevin Smith is a successful movie director. Long before the movie stuff. Oh my God, could you imagine running a comic book store? Who's finally living his dream. Comics. What stops a man from pursuing a part of his childhood? This is unbelievable. Not every day somebody walks in here with a first appearance Spider-Man. AMC takes you inside Kevin Smith's store. Oh my God, this is amazing. What's all that noise back there? What's he doing? I think he's playing with action figures. <laughs> AMC's Comic Book Man. The new season premieres Sunday, October 14th, only on AMC. Right on. Uh, let me introduce you to the boys, man, the guys that got me on television. First time I tried to get on TV was the Clerks cartoon. ABC aired it twice, shit can the show. So when we got the deal to be on AMC, I was like, that's awfully close to ABC. But uh, <laughs> thanks to the fucking funny that they provide unscripted every episode, man. We got a TV show again. Give it up for my friends. First off, Michael Zapsik.
Mr. Ming Chen. Walter Flanagan. And Brian motherfucking Johnson. Beard guy in full effect. Uh, okay, that was the beautiful thing for me. I mean, I've told this story a few other places. I'll tell it before we jump in. Last year, I got to watch the entire arc of people of the season, people reacting to the show uh, in live time on Twitter and on Facebook. Because as you all know, I'm just I'm plugged in like the lawnmower man. You know, I'm just I don't leave online and shit. That's why my wife never gets laid. So, at least not by me. So. Uh, I'm dialed in and whatnot, and the, the feedback that I got on, on Brian, uh, or as they called him, Beard Guy, because nobody bothered to learn his name, they just said, that's Beard Guy, sometimes they called him Alan Moore. Um, <laughs> but the, it went like this, episode one, the reaction was, I fucking hate Beard Guy. Why won't he leave Little Ming alone? <laughs> <laughs> that was Ming's mom. Um, after that, I think by the end of episode two, people were like, Beard Guy said some funny shit. <laughs> you know, get coming around or something like that. By episode four, I swear to you, I saw the following tweet. I want to be Beard Guy. <laughs> and then by the time we got to episode six, people, there were people who were like, I, and I saw one tweet said, I hated Brian in episode one. Episode six, he steals my heart. So it was nice to watch people kind of start out going, kill the monster, and then, <laughs> and then embrace them. Okay, but without further ado, I want to hear from you guys. You uh, spend, you are 95% of the show. I come in, do podcast wraparounds uh, three times during the shooting season. The rest of the time, it's just these guys in the store with cameras having to come up with shit to say on their feet. Thankfully, they're very funny. They all do podcasts. Brian and Walter do a podcast called Tell Them Steve, Dave. <laughs> Ming and Mike do a podcast called I Sell Comics. So the guys are very, very sharp at, at, at uh, talking extemporaneously. And thank God, because that's really all the show is. Bry, how did it feel going into season two, or do you have any anecdotes about uh, this season that you want to share with the audience? Can we turn his mic on? <laughs> here, why don't you come up here? I know it's asking a lot, but walk over to this mic, it works. I, I don't know what's going on with the mics. Until then, work this one. Does this one work? No. None of them. Come to this one, this one. Just come here. Okay. What was it like working on the season? Tell us a story. Uh, first, I'd like to address that we do 95% of the work and you make all the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucked up. Um. <laughs> oh, they were going to talk? <laughs> we thought they were just there to look pretty. Uh, any anecdotes from season two? Uh, let me see. Personal horrible tragedy. This still counts as season two. There was a panel we did where the mics didn't work. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Walt, help me out here. What was an anecdote? What was something fun or worth talking? The wedding that you saw, yeah, was... It was a lifelong dream to see Ming and Mike betrothed. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say any time we got to do... I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you guys all come gather around this microphone, please? <laughs> It's just like a podcast, folks. One mic, here we go. Come in tight. Okay. Anytime we got to do exactly what we wanted to do, huddle in, boys. <laughs> uh, it was fantastic. Like, when we got to come up with... <laughs> Look at this monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 
You realize I, have, I now have many questions to answer, my two little children up there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. They know more cursing than you do, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> You've only got 40 minutes left. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Uh, I would say any time we got to do exactly what we wanted to do, it was a good time. And the wedding was one of those moments. Well, two of us got to do exactly what we wanted to do, <laughs> and two of us didn't really. Well, I'm actually suspecting that three of you got to do exactly what you wanted to do. <laughs> it's been a lifelong dream of Ming's uh, ever since we started I Sell Comics. I'm only kidding, man. To be Sue Storm, the Invisible Girl. That's true. The best one out of the Fantastic Four. Yeah. <laughs> what showman? <laughs> and now you can see why they have a television show. <laughs> Let's open it. I mean, but the one mic thing is weird. Is there anything happening in the back that maybe, does anybody, is it just like an East Coast, we don't give a shit kind of thing? Or... Or can it be for you guys working on it? Meantime, well, you know what, we'll probably, how about we simplify it? We'll do Q&A, that way you guys ask a question and then one of these cats could, could answer. There are microphones uh, uh, right there and right there, but you could probably just put up your hand and we can hear work. you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm those, here to ask your questions. Do those microphones not work either? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Season two off to an amazing start. Can everyone please come up here and gather around <laughs> this microphone? <laughs> Yell it out and I'll, I'll translate back, go ahead. Two parts, we can't fucking hear the one part, lady. <laughs> okay, I, I think I got it. First part, Brian, how are your knees? How are my knees or how is my niece? My knees? Wait, knees or niece? I still don't. <laughs> and just answer both. Answer both. Okay. Uh, my knees are slightly better. My niece is great. You Took, both parts yeah. of the Took her to Amish town uh, with Ming this uh, past weekend to see how the other half lives. Are they the other half? <laughs> anyway, she's doing great. Is there a second part? Yeah, go ahead. Just say it. If I were to consider Red State to be the pinnacle of my career, yes. filmmaking career, yes? Where do I go from there? Sit on my ass for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's this feeling in America and this thought process of like, go achieve. I fucking did my achievements, man. I've gone further than I ever thought I would. I'm very content with where I wound up and stuff like that. So I feel like my journey's kind of come to a close. I'm going to close it rather than this kind of like self-imposed, got to go further, got to push, got to do more. Nah, I'm just going to do what I want now because I put in like nearly two decades of fucking hardcore service. Got paid for it. It wasn't like a military member or something. But I did. I put in my time in the directing field, and now I want to step back from the trough because I take up a big amount of space at that trough. As you've heard from some major airline, two spaces. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a world where like I step back from the trough, that makes more room for more creative folks. There are only limited amount of dollars out there in the industry to go around to creative people. Don't waste them on my ass anymore. I tell very small stories don't require a lot of money. Give them to people like Joss. Give them to people like fucking Chris Nolan. Give them to people like Zack Snyder. Give them to people like Tibor, the guy that made uh, the, the, the you know, uh, Wanted and also the Abraham Lincoln uh, vampire killer movie. Give it to those talented cats with vision, yes. They were clapping that the mics work. They don't give a shit what you say. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I thought I was on a roll there. All right, did they all work? Beautiful. Yes. Fantastic. Hello. Give yeah. it up for the crew at NYCC. Um, okay, so for me, I, you know, a lot of people are like, no, try harder, do something better. I will never make anything better than Red State. In my, by my estimation, I don't care what other people say, because I'm the artist at heart. And so when I can self-assess, step back, and be honest, and be like, look, it'll never get better than that, I'm just going to step away at that point. You know, it doesn't mean I'm not going to come here every year, it doesn't mean I'm not going to do all the other stuff, but making theatrical films, films for theatrical distribution, that's not really my game anymore. It can't be. They want to tell very expensive stories. The small stories I used to tell, people don't want to finance anymore. If you want to finance them, you do it yourself or you go to like a Kickstarter or something like that or an Indiegogo. 
So I don't know, I put in my time, I felt like I've done enough. Let me step back. I don't have anything new to say, I'll be honest with you. Um, Red State was kind of my last blah, hit somebody is the one that I got in the chamber and I got to shrink its length down to shoot a movie out of it. But other than that, there's not much more that I can add to the discussion in filmmaking. Some people will argue that I never added anything to the discussion in filmmaking. <laughs> But I can step out in other places and do other cool shit, the podcasting, the TV shows, just standing on stage and talking to people. Like Stuff like that is more intriguing to me and kind of like where my heart is now. My heart was in making films 20 years ago, but I did it a bunch and it was great and I had fun, but there's so many other cool things to do. You know, for a lot of years I did one thing and every once in a while I'd squeeze in something else like a comic book. But now I just do a lot of shit. I try everything. And some people be like, yeah, but you're the master of none. Guess what? I was never going to be the master of fucking anything except baiting. So I might as well try everything. I might as well give it all a shot. Try every art. Sample it out, man. I hope in 10 years I'm, you see me playing bongos, Matt McConaughey style. Not naked, mind you. I'll be wearing a shirt, a hockey jersey probably. But I mean... I like getting into everything. I'm doing shit now that I didn't imagine I would do 10 years ago. 10 years ago, if you told me one day you're gonna have a radio network with you and your friends, I'd be like, how the fuck, no way, that's impossible. I'd probably put a dick in my mouth before that happened. <laughs> well, I did and we are. So <laughs> sometimes that's how you make shit happen. But uh, it was, it, it's, it's been a great time. And, and based on that, I feel dopey just doing the one thing film i want to do a bunch of other stuff like this so I, that's why i kind of put that to the side there's definitely one more movie coming i promise that'll wrap it all out and then i'll just be doing other shit like that okay thank you oh there's mike over here go ahead man please talk to these guys uh i have a question for you and walt uh question for me and walt go ahead yeah. Widening Gyre, part two. Yeah, uh, when, what's the progress on that? When we, when, when Comic Book Men happened, we were where? What issue were you drawing? Four. You were on issue four of six. Yes. Holy shit. Um, issue four of six, he was drawing when, we, when I called him up and said, hey man, there's a good chance we might do a TV show based on the comic book store. So naturally that went to the back burner because we were told point blank, like I asked Dan DiDio, I was like, when do we have to finish our story? And he's like, you finish whenever you want because that universe is going away, man. Now it's all gonna be the 52, the new 52. So at that point, we were kind of like, all right, there's no pressure, people like the book a lot. I like to let it sit out there. You know, in the moment when that book came out, we worked so hard for a year, a year and change in advance. Couldn't wait for that sixth issue because the sixth issue was the one, if you haven't read it, spoilers, I'm not, I won't tell you, but there's a big reveal, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. at the end of the story. But when it came out, the only thing that like some mouthpieces wanted to talk about was like, you made Batman piss himself in the comic book and shit. <laughs> and, they went, and then this is that they got really outraged. They're like, you took a moment from year one and destroyed DC continuity by, continuity by suggesting that Batman might have wet himself. And then a few months later, DC blew up their own continuity, man. And suddenly I didn't look so bad anymore. I was like, now a little piss ain't so bad, is it, motherfucker? <laughs> So in that world where Dan was just like, you get to it when you want to, and you know, comic book man, this opportunity popped up in front of us, that went to the forefront, and believe me, if anyone didn't want to fucking do comic book men before finishing Widening Gyre, it was Walter. Walter was like, let's finish what we started. I was like, no, no, we got time to finish it. It took me five years to finish Spider-Man, you know? So I was laying it out on a different sort of timeline. We're four issues in at this point. There's two issues to go. Now that we're done with season two, it's my intent to finish the last script. I have got issue five and I just have issue six to do. Get both to Walter and boom, he could be off and running. So definitely, definitely by the end of 2013, you'll see the end of The Widening Gyre, which if you hadn't read, read yet, go check it out. It's a sequel to Batman Cacophony that me and Walt did together as well. And it's also a quasi sequel to my Green Arrow run that I did a few years ago called Quiver. Say again? Then you're doing hit somebody after that? Hit somebody? Hit somebody I'm getting to the moment I get that script to 150 pages in length. My problem was I said, I'm going to do two hockey movies, but guess what? You know how hard it is to get one hockey movie finance? <laughs> getting two is nearly fucking impossible. So I decided at that point, all right, man, I'll make it one movie. I got one shot. The movie's about uh, taking one big shot. So I was like, fuck it, instead of two, I'll do one. 
but that left me with 240 pages in length that I had to get into a 120 page script format. I gave myself an extra 30 pages, so I'm allowing 150 pages, but I've been trying ever since I announced it, somebody, ever since I announced it would be one movie again, to get it into that one, form, one, one script format. I go in and shave periodically. There's a lot of good stuff, so it's tough to get let go. But at the same time, I'm pretty judicious when it comes to editing my shit. I have no problem killing the babies as they speak. Um, I, I, if, even though I wrote it, it doesn't make a genius, and in fact, most shit I write isn't, so it's very easy to kind of kill it before it, it hits the world. So I'm still working on the script. As soon as I have it down to 150 pages, we're going forward. Promise. Right, awesome. Thank right. you. Thank you. I have water. Sir. Yes. Um, one, I wanted to thank you, Kevin, for being awesome, kicking ass, and making some of the greatest films I've ever got to witness in my life. Thank you, Thank sir. you, and hats off to you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Um, my question for you um, would be, out of all the films that you've done in your life, which was the favorite one you've done? Um, probably Clerks 2. Clerks 2 was the, the most fun to make. Um, I, I love Red State, and I loved making it, but Clerks 2 uh, felt like what I described for a long period as the last good time. That felt like the end of things. That was the movie where I was just like, man, it'll never be better than this. And, and I was right, it really was never better than that in terms of making the flick. We did it for like five million, we did it with mostly just friends. Um, it sounds like a lot of money at this point, five million and stuff, but it, it, at that point in 2006, we, we didn't really get paid, you know, as a favored nations kind of thing. Nobody made a mint off the movie except for the Weinstein Company. So for us, <laughs> It was a kind of labor of love and an uphill battle because Jeff Anderson didn't want to do it. He was really? just like, Clerks is a wonderful movie, dude. That's our legacy. Don't fuck with that. You make a Clerks 2, it could suck. So I was always trying to please uh, Jeff in that movie. Jeff was the guy that I always had to kind of get over and get through and win over. And slowly over the course of making Clerks 2, we did. By the end of the show, he was just like, this is wonderful. He's going, this is nothing what I thought it would be. We actually did something good. We honored the first one and stuff. And so I know there's some people like, fuck you, I like Clerks better. You're absolutely welcome to that preferential treatment uh, of that movie. I, I can't hate you for liking Clerks more than Clerks 2. Like one of them, that's all I ask. But the guy... <laughs> The guy who was the most important to me on that movie was Jeff Anderson, and we converted him in a good way. So that, to me, was a real beautiful experience. You gotta find, I was talking earlier today, sometimes you build in some shit to, to do that's just fun for you, the stuff that makes it worth it. You know, when I was a kid, I was like, I just wanna make a movie, and that was its own reward. But I've done that a few times, so now you gotta add some shit to it, where you're like, I just wanna make a movie, and let me see if I could do this at the same time. You add on these little goals and little hurdles, for yourself and, and, and kind of, uh, it's been, I don't know, it's worked for me. It kind of keeps me invested in shit a little bit more because I'm like, let me just see if I could do this on the side. Awesome, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, yes. <laughs> Yell it out one more time, I'm sorry. If you could ever be a superhero in a movie, which one would you be? If I could ever be, oh, it's just that the mic's tall, I'm sorry. It, oh, what? Oh, if you could ever be a superhero in a movie, which one would you be? I'm gonna give it to the boys, Walter. You could be a superhero? Y okay, um, yeah. <laughs> Professor X? Why would you go for Professor X? He just sits around talking. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Mike, if you could be a superhero? Are you kidding me? He's got 20 years of friendship to back that up. I'm kind of leery about casting you as a superhero. I think it's more they're asking what you would be. Well, I threw it to you. I took it off me. Oh, oh you, you were saying I would be Professor X? Yeah. Because I sit around and talk? <laughs> but you like podcasts. <laughs> I thought you were talking about you. I was like, that's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> now that's about me. Fuck you. <laughs> I would be the Hulk. Um, who would you be, Mike? Who would I be? Um, I've always dug Nightwing. I like Nightwing. <laughs> He's sort of... Um, like a cross between Superman and Batman. He's uh, optimistic and he can kick ass when he needs to. Ming, Ming Ling. Uh, does a uh, grunt from Gen 13, does he count as a superhero? No. Come on. I feel like I can relate to him. He was Asian, he was huge, he got all the women. That's all he did. No. All right. As long as you didn't want to be the girl from Gwen Gen no, 13. No, Caitlin Fritt, no, Caitlin Which I remember you saying at one point, you were like, she's pretty hot. She and I was hot. like, she is hot. And you were like, I'd like to be her. And I was like, <laughs> I said, why? And you were like, her shoes are excellent. 
You're a shoe man. Everybody knows that. Brian. Superhero? Uh, I guess I would be Rick from The Walking Dead, which yeah. airs this Sunday on AMC, and it is not on the Dish Network. <laughs> Kid's so disillusioned, man. He's like, he's like, if that's what middle age is like. <laughs> How are you, sir? Oh, I'm just fine. Um, I want to ask you, um, since we, um, the last uh, thing was um, was inside the Batmobile, like um, uh, the uh, Batmobile and everything, so a documentary about it. I want to ask you, um, what uh, Batmobile, if you can pick one, what would, it, what would it be? Uh, my Batmobile forever, for the rest of my life, will be the Michael Keaton Anton first Batmobile. <laughs> which I tried desperately to win. MTV did a contest in 1989 where you could win the Batmobile, and all you had to do was call in at a certain point and shit. So I sat there for fucking 24 hours in advance, man. <laughs> this is before we ever had the internet. And uh, I just couldn't wait and kept waiting and waiting and then started the call-ins immediately. Got the message, never got the winning thing. And they introduced the fucking winning guy like a, a month later or something like that. And I was like, who won the Batmobile? And the guy was like, this is fabulous. And I was just like, he won the Batmobile? <laughs> um, so I, I wanted it, but I never, I never got it. But I, I never will. I, you know, sometimes it's nice to want shit and not get your hands on it and stuff. But if I had to pick one of them, it would be that one, the Anton first. Which one? Jeff Dunham. Jeff Dunham. Isn't that fucked up? If you don't, I don't know if you... I guess a lot of people know this, but Jeff Dunham, the, the, this guy, like, hey, blah, 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 blah. the guy who talks to his hand for a living and makes billions of dollars doing it, bought the fucking Batmobile, man. Like, I remember talking to somebody and they were just like, look at Jeff Dunham. I was like, fuck you, he owns the Batmobile. I'll talk to my hand, your hand, his dick, whatever, to get my own Batmobile. Batmobile you'd prefer? Uh, I like the Batmobile from the 40s, that Dick Sprang one, with the big bat head on the front. <laughs> That'd be the one I'd drive. I'd be the uh, 66 Adam West Batmobile. <laughs> Mainly because I got to drive that one, I never got to drive the other ones, like the bat head one from the 40s. Although that sounds like it'd be pretty cool to drive. Now, I've always been a big fan of the Tumblr. So I think, <laughs> drive through walls and then, uh, you know, when you want a motorcycle, bam, you hit a button and you shoot out of it. You'd lose the effect when you had all those phone books you were sitting on driving it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing there, hockey man. pads, but you are sitting on phone books. <laughs> Batman. No time for love, Dr. Jones. <laughs> Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the remake starring Ming Chen. <laughs> Brian, which Batmobile would you make yours? Uh, I'd go for the 66 Batgirl Batcycle. Oh. <laughs> Smart. Mm -hmm. And sexy. And practical. And I'd even ride bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Remember those twins in the 70s who used to ride those mopeds? What's that? Those twins used to ride the mopeds. And the two fat the... twins oh, that yeah. rode the mopeds? <laughs> me and Girl's Brian not as fat as me. Guys, <laughs> um, is that good? Sorry. Oh, man, you, I'm loving the way you're rocking that uh, Oreos cow Thank you. Jersey, man. Thank you. <laughs> don't hate. Don't hate. Thank you very much, sir. Way to lose the audience, man. Yes. Uh, hi, Kevin. Over, is there another one? Oh, I didn't even know there was a third aisle. Holy shit. And there's a Lady Thor. All right, first up uh, for you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, oh, it's actually working. Uh, First off, I'm a big fan of the podcast, so thank you, all of you on the stage. Uh, even I sell comics, I know that everybody listens to it. Johnson told you to say that, didn't he? You know, yeah, I'm sorry. But uh, speaking for all of you, uh, there's so many podcasts on the CERN network, and all of them are amazing. But if you were to cast anybody, given East Coast, West Coast, wherever, what would be your all-star cast uh, for a podcast, and what would it be named, do you think? Um, I mean, honestly, some of my favorite uh, recordings that I ever put on any wax, anywhere, digital wax, if you will, uh, were some of the early Smodcasts that I did with Brian and Walter. So when you go back and listen to them, man, like, 
you hear me. That's, that's where I start getting insanely unguarded on Smodcast and start really cracking up and letting loose and realizing what Smodcast was. When it started, it was kind of engineered to sit down with Scott Mosier so we could spend time together that wasn't work related. All we would do after a certain point was talk about work and stuff. I said, you know, they make these things called podcasts now, man. <laughs> Ricky Gervais did one I hear. And uh, maybe we could do one. We'll sit down once a week, record this podcast. We'll talk to each other. We'll put it up on the internet. And the reason we put it up was to make ourselves accountable. Because I knew if we just sat down, recorded our conversations, or didn't record them, it would fall apart. We'd eventually stop doing it three times in. So I felt like if we put it up there, there's some sort of accountability. So it began with that, man. And it was conversations with me and Moj, and we had a blast and stuff. And periodically, I'd be back east, and I was like, this would be fun to do with my other fucking friends as well. And I started doing it with them. And if you listen to the Ark of Smodcast, it's probably in the first maybe 15 to 30 episodes, you hear when I sit down with Brian and Walt and break up, that's the moment where I'm like, oh, this is what Smodcast is truly meant to be, the thing that makes me feel best in life. The network itself grew out of the podcast, and the idea was always meant to be, this is a living biography. Instead of writing a fucking book, I'll sit down with the people that I would have written about, the people who matter to me most in life, and hear the shit that they have to say. We'll sit around and talk about shit I'm passionate about, like hockey or fucking Batman or something like that. The idea of being able to sit in front of a laptop, like Professor X, as Walter says, <laughs> and just talk, man, was so empowering to me. I grew up listening to Howard Stern, same as Brian Johnson, man. We'd sit there every morning and record the show on cassette because we'd have to go off to school, so you'd listen to it when you got back home. That was something I did before I even knew Brock, and later on I heard he did the same thing. And the reason that we listened to him is because he made the day go by quicker. He said shit that made sense to us, man. He was real. He was being insanely candid and honest. More information than anyone ever asked for. And you live like 10 years of that, that's formative, man. When every morning of your life you're hearing somebody whose job it is to go out there and be themselves, that gives you something to shoot for. And one day when the technology was within reach, when suddenly people were like, you can do your own radio show if you make one of these podcasts, I was just like, shit, man, for a chance to pretend to be Howard Stern for an hour? That'd be amazing, let's do it. Sat down, it's been the best decision I ever made. I wound up being able to live off the podcast, you know? It was never the aim, it wasn't like, this will be the financial backbone of everything we do. It just kinda happened organically, and that happened because I love sitting down, talking to my fucking friends. I mean, think about it. I sat down, talked to my friends for a little while, a couple years, and it aggregated into a television show. Magical things happen when you sit down and talk to the people that mean the most to you, man. And that's all we've been doing here, so. Smodcast, without it, this wouldn't happen, but without those two dudes specifically, I probably wouldn't have evolved it to what it is today. The thing, like, like I said, makes me feel good. Smodcast, a lot of people like to listen to the network. For me, it's totally masturbatory. I just love it so much, because it's all about my friends and my world and shit like that. So my favorite episodes being with these guys, I would have to say, like if I was putting together a super group, it would be me, Bri, Walt, Scott, uh, and Ralph. And Jen. I have to include Jen or else I'll never get laid again. So, um, <laughs> and that's not to leave out fucking Mike and Ming. They're great. They could totally oh, yes, it open. Is. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be it. Johnson told and and that's that, a long way of saying that response, a very long way of saying as well that I, I love the fact that people come out and see us and shit. We love to be entertaining or at least try to be entertaining. But kids, if you've ever listened to the podcast we do and you watch this reel, ain't nothing different going on up there or on these podcasts than you do in your own fucking lives. You got friends just like I got friends, man. Sit down with them in front of microphones, start generating content. Now a lot of people be like, well, I'm not that person. I don't go out in front of people, blah, blah, blah. I'm not talented. I hear that shit a lot. Brother, I'm the least talented fucking person you'll ever meet, man. And I've been making this shit work for 20 fucking years. And it comes out of the, the it comes out of something real. It comes out of real, genuine friendship and enthusiasm for chatter or trying to be entertaining. Anybody could do this, man. Go home when you're done with the con. Even shit, start now with the con. You got yourself a smartphone. Go grab one of those mics that you could jack right into it. Start putting a microphone in people's faces, not just fucking famous people, because we always hear those people talk. Talk to your friends, talk to your mom. I sat down with my mother and got an amazing series of podcasts out of my mother, man, who some would say is one of the most boring people in the world. <laughs> but she was amazing. Granted, I had to stuff weed cake down her throat, but <laughs> she was up for it and shit. She was game, and boy, it was fantastic. And one day, my mom's gonna pass. My father already died. One day, I'm gonna lose my mother. 
and I'll have that forever. I'll go back and listen to that conversation. Think about all the conversations you've ever had with the people you dig, or even the people you don't dig, but man, it made you fucking laugh. When you get together with friends you haven't seen in years, one of the first things you do is, remember that fucking time we did this? And you retell old fucking stories. That's all podcasting is. Sit down with the people you love, your friends, your fucking family, and start telling the stories you love, because there ain't no reason to just be entertained. You can go out and be entertaining as well. If you got a laptop, you're already there, man. Do it, and you could wind up on TV. Podcasts sometimes turn into broadcasts. Next. Are we good? Is that everything? I'm sorry. That was, that was great. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Um, an honor, Kevin, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Gentlemen, a great um, just question. What was, what was your favorite thing about making com uh, Comic Book Men Season 1? Most fond memories. Uh, for me, my favorite part of uh, Comic Book Men Season 1, I think, was when I heard from Brian. I didn't hear from Walter, but I heard from Brian. Walter never wanted to watch the show. He didn't want to do the show. And I was like, please, please, dude, please. And he's like, all right. But I'm never going to watch it. You can't make me watch it. And I was like, fair, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> I heard from Brian one day. We were about episode three, and Brian sent me an email, and it just said in the subject line, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew what it meant. And I was like, oh, God, I could open this up, and it could be hell on earth. It could be him going, he watched it. You're fucked, man. Like, <laughs> you're in so much trouble. But I opened it up, and he, it, it said, Walter finally watched comic book men, dot, dot, dot. Next line, he actually liked it, you know? <laughs> Which in the equivalent, it's the equivalent of if you grew up in our age, there was the life commercial of like, hey, Mikey, he likes it. <laughs> Walter was our Mikey, man. The fact that he ate a bowl of fucking comic book men and was like, it's not bad, was pretty damn <laughs> cool, man. So that was the highlight for me. What was the highlight for you? Uh, highlight for me? Um, I guess when we made the commercial episode, you know, it was, a, I think, of it. It was one of the last episodes we shot, but it, it felt like, uh, you know, it, the new, the strangeness of it, the uniqueness of uh, having cameras on you, you, you forgot about it by the time, like, the last week of filming was around, <laughs> and we just kind of, like, it just had fun, and, you know, and it really was um, the moment where I was like, you know, this could be fun if you, if you let it the commercial, the commercial episode we did, they put, in, in the episode, they're like, let's put a stash commercial together, and the commercial is, like, over the top bad and obvious yeah. and it was based on a series of commercials that we kind of grew up watching <laughs> a local uh, spot for hobby masters and yes. toy masters hobby toy masters. masters you go on the internet and see this man there's commercials and i'm not putting anybody down i'm, I'm all for anybody like getting creative in front of a camera but these these commercials are hysterical it's a brother and sister no nah, husband no? and wife <laughs> they're they're married okay yeah. they're both <laughs> And, they, and it's basically promoting a store in Red Bank called Hobby Masters, and they also have a side called Toy Masters. And it's so straight to the camera, straightforward. It's like, tell them what we have, Arlene. <laughs> and we would always sit around and chuckle about them. So on this episode, like, they were trying to come up with stuff to do for the, for the show. And Walter was like, let's do an episode that where we try to do a commercial. And the commercial wound up being like that. So I wasn't around for the shooting. And when they sent me the commercial to watch and I finally saw it, I was like, it's a Hobby Masters commercial. <laughs> and that's going to make sense to like maybe 12 people in the world. But man, it felt fucking good. Uh, I'm going to eschew the, uh, the obvious answer and say the con gone wrong. That was, that was uh, when we all joined together and um, made lemons, lemonade out of lemons because uh, it could have been bad. That's, uh, it was a recipe for disaster, but we pulled uh, that out of the fire, so that's pretty cool. Nice. <laughs> What's with the scoff? <laughs> Some more catchphrase, What's the, not catchphrase. Some cliches. Buzz words. <laughs> yes, we turned over every stone. Uh, you gave it 110 percent. Yeah. <laughs> You, uh, you know, although it didn't work out that zombie promotion, getting in that zombie makeup was awesome. I'm sure some of you know what that feels like. And um, the funny thing was uh, when, I, when it was all done, when the zombie makeup was all done, I texted a photo of it to my wife. Like, hey, check me out. Look how good I look. And she was like, do not come home like that and scare the kids. <laughs> do not come home like that and scare the kids. Some of you might have kids out there. The best thing about having kids is messing with them. So that's exactly what I did. And uh, did they love it? I don't know. But... <laughs> Uh, for me, it was the tattoo episode. Um, simply because, like you, I thought, here's the person who means the most to me in the world. At some point, she will be able to look back and be like, wow, you were once something? <laughs> 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 so, so being able to be on the show with her and, and have the, 
the tad of her, like, watch her reaction. And that was her real reaction, you know? Uh, that, to me, that was pretty big. That was a big moment. Show up everyone your sleeve. If you haven't seen the show, the episode, man, Brian got this tattoo of his niece, Sage, done as a zombie. As a zombie. On a tricycle. So she's undead. <laughs> um, when, when he's talking about it on the show, Walter's reaction, and they showed a little bit of it in the show, but the conversation went on for 10 minutes. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> it's he was so mystified. disturbing. And it, it's a fucking sleeve. Show him how large it is. Uh, I actually got a little bit of uh, color added to Hold it. Hold it up. I remember at one point I got my kid's name on my arm, it says Harley and shit, and then she saw that episode, she's like, why not a picture, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> that was six straight hours in a chair, too. Really? Mm -hmm. You didn't go back, it was just like, do it all in one. We shot, we shot the, the inking, then we went back to the store and shot more stuff. <laughs> what a soldier. This guy right here in the shell, he's a taskmaster. <laughs> this is the guy without whom, man, we don't get anything done. Stand up just way. Brian Nichelle, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yes? Uh, yeah, my question is for Brian. Uh, I just want to know if your niece took the Barbies out of the box. My <laughs> knees? Are you talking about my knees? <laughs> <laughs> Did my niece take the Barbie out of Did the box? Did she take the Barbies out of the box, the, the two Barbies that you purchased? What were they again? They were Batgirl, it was Batgirl, Batgirl and Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman, yeah. She did, why? Because uh, uh, I'm the one who sold them to yeah. you. Oh, are you? Uh, oh, that's right, man, hey! You need to understand the lights in my eyes. It's you! Oh, oh. hello! <laughs> I just wanted to know, and thank you for uh, sticking up for my Barbies. <laughs> Not in the least, man. It's so weird. I'm like, I've seen you on TV. You're famous. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, is that good? Yeah, we're good. Yes. Oh, no, do I go? No, I went there, there, and here. Yes, sorry. Um, I've been trying to ask you this three times now, and it'll settle a dispute between me and my husband if you could answer it. Okay. But um, I know in Florida you said you think the most epic uh, live action film would be a backstory of Boba Fett, but when it comes down to it, who's more iconic, Boba Fett or Vader? Boba Fett or who? Vader. Vader. Yes. So you would say like a Vader film? But didn't we see that? And Vader turned no, out to be a, a film, whiny just... emo kid. <laughs> Having seen his backstory, let's go for Boba Fett next time, man. Sounds good. I'm sorry? Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, right. Did I win you over that quickly? <laughs> no, I'm still for Darth Vader, so. So I didn't win you over at all? Not at all, I don't. But we can agree to disagree. That is fine. Democracy. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> how are you? Good, how are you? My question is for all of you. What do you guys think are some of the biggest misconceptions about comic book fans? About what? Comic book fans? About comic book fans. Um, yeah, exactly. Is that any of them are normal? <laughs> <laughs> any of you motherfuckers. So go ahead, you take it. Start from there and we'll work down. You're gonna ask me misconceptions about comic no, book fans? No, Ming, you were already, <laughs> you're like everything. Oh, who, me? Uh, I think people, people, People scoff at us a lot, you know, some of the so-called normal people scoff at us. We're, we're great guys, man. We're great guys. Me <laughs> you don't got to sell him. <laughs> I yeah, know. Oh, I, I don't, I don't you've turned me him, around but... on these geeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody scoffs at us anymore, to be honest with you. Now everybody knows the power that the geek market holds. Like, when you watch The Avengers and The Dark Knight Returns and Spider-Man, three massive comic book movies this summer, all make the amount of money they did, we're no longer marginalized. We are the voice, you know, at least of pop culture right. entertainment. Which is great, like, because I, I think that's all we were ever interested in. I don't think geeks want to inherit the world. They just want their corner of it, and that's movies and comics and yeah. entertainment. Sure. Um, the fact that nobody thinks we get laid. <laughs> we do. And Living I approve. Right there. Stand up, boys. <laughs> Thank you. And meet Mike's Russian bride, Ivana. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good How, thing I don't, uh, I completely ignore you. What was that? How like a comic book guy to be like, I've gotten laid, here's proof, boys. Yeah. <laughs> if I thought that would have worked, I would have brought my kid too. I never thought about that. Living proof. Sir, you. 
I think comic book fans spend a lot of time worrying about this question way too much, though. I and mean, like you said, I mean, it, we, we, inha we rule it now. I mean, every form of entertainment that's huge is comic book related. Stop worrying about this, you know, this um, little brother sis syndrome. Oh, the little brother, yeah, the, there's no need for a Napoleon complex or no, something? No, not at all. We won. That's your assessment? Yeah. <laughs> Victory is ours. Victory is ours. <laughs> Feel like Patton up here. Um, I don't know. For me, uh, I guess kind of the biggest misconception of us comic book fans is we all have giant dicks. <laughs> Uh, the show is called Comic Book Men, ladies and gentlemen. It starts Sunday after both The Walking and The Talking Dead. Please tune in and watch. If you liked what you saw today, there's a, a, a more dirty version, if that's possible, that we're going to do tonight at the Gramercy Theater. We all do a companion podcast to this show called The Secret Stash. And so we're going to do that tonight at the Gramercy. There's some tickets left if you want to come out. 10 o'clock. If not, tune in to Comic Book Men on Sunday. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for giving a shit. And we'll see you next year. Good night. Walter Flanagan, Mike Zapsick, Ming Chen, Brian Johnson, the comic book man. <laughs>